and welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. It's Sunday night, and that means uh, it's our Q&A segment here on ThinkSpot. I want to thank everybody who took some time to send us some comments, a couple of questions. Uh, always great hearing from our friends here on ThinkSpot, and, and a lot of really great questions. I'm hoping we get to most of them tonight. Uh, and, and, and if I don't get to them tonight, we will get to them uh, during the week on our regular uh, radio program, 9 to 11, Monday through Friday. Most certainly we'll do that. But at one point or another, they will be addressed. Uh, but I'm not going to take too much time blathering on because I've got a special guest here with us. Uh, Marshall Herskovitz is an American film director, writer, producer, all around incredible guy. Also, also the reason I like him. President Emeritus of the Producers Guild of America. He's famous for such films as The Last Samurai, Blood Diamond, Jack Reacher, one of my favorites, and also Legends of the Fall, my wife's favorite. Uh, Marshall, thanks for taking time for us. Hey there. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, and it on is, Think Spot. It is great to have you here with us. And, and I'm a really big fan, and I, I'm a big fan of your work and, and of you personally. Um, Thank you, sir. I want to jump right into the middle of this. Don't want to waste too much sure. time. Um, sure. we're, we're two months into the Biden administration. Uh, we've got the American Rescue Plan pushed through. I think some, some good things. I want to get your assessment of where we are right now. Well, I think it's an astonishing beginning. And I think we live in a, we live in a, a popular culture right now, a, a news culture that's so geared toward criticism that it's very hard for people to see the context. And I think the fact that they got this bill through which is going to affect people's lives if they can uh, keep most of these things continuing, which I think they will, for the next 20 years. I mean, this is an astonishing bill. And yes, there are things in it that, that, that maybe they, uh, we, we wanted more of, and we can talk about that. But, you know, we forget that we live in a representative democracy. You don't get 100% wins. That's not how it works. Right. And, and, and people think that somehow the other side's going to just go away. They're not going to go away. So this is an amazing bill and it's an amazing start. And, you know, I think none of us thought that Biden would be as effective as he might be turning out to be. And I have some thoughts on that that I can talk about in a little bit. But I but I think he's off to a great start. I, I absolutely agree. I he was I, I'll be honest, he was my fourth choice. Uh, but I'll be honest, I think in retrospect and looking back, I think the American people were smarter than I was uh, because I think he's the right choice at this moment. I think he's had a calming effect. Uh, I don't think he's been bluster or I think he's just been get up and do the job and, you know, not pat himself on the back. I think he's what we need at this moment. Yes. And, and here's the thing about Biden. If you remember him from 15, 20 years ago, he was so full of himself and he talked too much and, and you couldn't stop him from talking. There's some way in which, He's better at 78 than he was at 48 because now he just does the job, you know. So so God bless him. I, and I hope he stays healthy. And and he's got a very supple and agile mind. Any notion that this guy is losing it is just, you know, wish 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 fulfillment on the right because because yeah. he's on top of it. No, I mean, when he fell walk, going up the stairs on, on Air Force One, the so right lost I. their mind. <laughs> uh, and I said, look, I love the fact that the guy got up. And then yeah. he fell again, and he got up again. Yeah. That's what I like yeah. about him. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'll bet you his foot is still bothering him, even though they say it doesn't. Right. You know, but it doesn't matter because, the, look, you know, we all you, we're old enough to remember Gerald Ford, who fell all the time, who actually was one of the most athletic presidents we've ever had. He just fell a lot. Yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but here's the thing. You know what we're not talking about, and the reason the right has such a stranglehold of our media. We're not talking about what you were saying at the beginning. We got an incredible bill pushed through that's going to help yeah. millions of people uh, get yeah. through this pandemic. And and yeah. they're doing it. They're getting the vaccines out faster than they ever imagined. Fifty eight days it took them to get to a million. Uh, we're yeah. going to we're going to pass right on by that and hopefully two billion by the end. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And he was. See, this is a guy who understands what it means to under promise. Right. Who, who does that today? He 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 knew, by the way. 100 million vaccines in 100 days was what Trump was planning anyway. They right. knew they could achieve that. So now they can look great because they're beating it. No, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. I, I said a million. I meant 100 million. 100. We knew what you meant. I mean, the numbers are, you know, just 
Uh, and I'm, I'm waiting for my vaccine. So let's jump into the questions because this is yes, what, what people want to want to get to. Uh, I want to yeah. get your thoughts as president emeritus of the uh, Producers Guild of America. Uh, yeah. uh, Code Merchant asked the question, why are young people turning away from unionization so much these days? Why doesn't it appeal to millennials? Uh, curious your thoughts. Well, it's a really interesting question. And I can't say I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I have spoken to some people about it. And I think... You know, I'm going to say this as a as a proud union member. I belong to four different unions. OK, and, and um, nevertheless, there are aspects of unionization where people give up their freedom. In other words, there is a trade off we have as members of unions. Um, that's why they call right to work states right to work, because there are things unions demand of their members, which you are, if you're going to be, if you're going to work in that field, you are not free to to go against. And I think there are a lot of young people who don't feel part of any community, who feel that the institutions of America have let them down, their schools let them down, they owe too much money, and they don't see the value because they haven't grown up in a world of where understanding what unions do for them, they don't see the value of being part of something that says you have to pay this and you have to show up then and, and you can't work if we go on strike. They just, you know, they have basically been indoctrinated by Republican and right wing messaging for 40 years, you know, about how unions go against the American ethic of freedom, which is crap, as but, we know. No, I'm right there with you. And I would argue I'm, I'm going to take it a little bit different direction. I'm going to go where you started, uh, it, where you, you went there in the middle of they don't know. Uh, most yes. people, they've missed that generation. Uh, their That's parents, right. they, they saw their parents losing jobs. Uh, they saw the deindustrialization of this country uh, happen in their childhood. And that union culture of that I grew up understanding that a union job equaled a better life, uh, right. they didn't get. Uh, but I'll right. tell you, the more millennials I talk to, and especially the generation after them, they are right. now looking back and going, wait a second. Uh, those unions are the way towards the future. Uh, this is what this is what we need to do. And look, uh, since the laws have been so badly skewed, the ossification of labor law in this country to the side of the employer class, actually joining and forming a union is much, much more difficult than it really should be. And they don't have the opportunity to engage. And I think Amazon right now is a perfect example of how difficult it is for workers perfect, to, to perfect. get their rights. One more thing. One more thing. The gig economy appealed to millennials because of the idea that you could work on your own and be on your own. And I think people are beginning to see how flawed the gig economy is and how it leaves people completely without protection right. uh, in, in so many different ways. And it's not the panacea that young people thought it would be. Yeah, but here, Marshall, uh, the gig economy is not new. Uh, you talk to anybody who's an electrician, anyone who's a plumber, you talk to any of these guys, they're all gig workers too. Uh, they yes. work for multiple contractors, uh, but yes. all of those people have the same contract. They make the same wages, the same benefits, the same pension, the same working conditions, no matter yes. how many contractors they work for. So there is already a model uh, for workers in the gig well economy said. to organize well and to have the portability of benefits and the portability of wages. Well said. Uh, that's yep. just my view. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, Democratic president, House, Senate majority, and still no $15 an hour minimum wage. Shame on all the so-called Democrats. Uh, next time you all want to bitch about Republicans not doing enough to low for the lower and middle class, just take a look at what all of you had done uh, when actually came comes to helping them. Uh, thoughts? Yes, I have a lot of thoughts on this. First of all, if the if the minimum wage had risen with GDP from 1969, it would be twenty one dollars today, not 15. OK, so we need a 15 dollar minimum wage at least. All right. But again, I go back to the notion that w this is not a monarchy. It wasn't for Trump and it's not for Biden and it's not for the Democrats. OK, and this bill had to get passed. And, you know, if there was by the way. From what I understand, even the Republicans are willing to raise the minimum wage. The argument was about how much. Right. OK. And so I'm not trying to minimize at all what people are going through. It's horrible. And and they've been and it's, they've been going through it for 40 years. OK. 
but we can only accomplish what we can accomplish. And when you look at this one point nine trillion bill, trillion dollar bill, and you see that it's going to cut childhood poverty by 40 or 45 percent, when you see all the things that it does, you have to say, yes, we didn't get there on the 15. And what we should have done, frankly, is we should have compromised and made it lower rather than not have it. But maybe the politicians have another idea and maybe they're going to get a bill through to get to 15. We should be higher than 15. The higher. point is, the, the point is, you can't you can't govern a country just on the basis of knowing what's right. You have to also persuade people and you have to get people to go along or else you're going to lose. Yep. No, you're absolutely right. And look, here the reality is um, you, you've got a 50 50 split in the Senate. Yeah, uh, it's not yes. like the Democrats have dictatorial control and can yes. do what can drive the steamroller right over people. They don't. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, which, but but this brings me to an interesting point because yeah. you know I've yeah. been saying we need to do away with the arcane measure of the filibuster. I say we should be going back, and I've been saying this for years that yes. we should be going back to a talking filibuster. The responsibility should be on the minority to hold things up and not the yeah. majority to get things going. And look, if right. you're against it, stand there and tell me why. I want to hear Mitch McConnell. I want to hear Ted Cruz. I want to hear Rand Paul. I want to hear all of them tell me why they're against raising the minimum wage, why they're against workers being able to organize, and why they're against anything else. I want to hear right. them tell me why. Right, but by the way, what you just said about the filibuster is the answer, I believe, and it's not what's being talked about. In other words, Democrats are talking about getting rid of the filibuster, and I'm convinced that would be the that would just be the death of us because we could lose the majority in two years, we could lose the presidency in four years, and then there would be nothing to stop the Republicans from banning abortion, from yep. from saying we have to have a balanced budget, from any number, from getting rid of of Social Security. You know, the, the, there is a purpose to the filibuster, but it should go back to the way it was, which is what, just what you said. It should be, first of all, you have to keep talking. And second of all, you have to keep all the people there present who support it so they can't just phone it in. And believe me, these guys are, you know, they're all millionaires. They don't want to do that. They all, that. Most things would then get passed on a straight majority vote at that point no and look we're it's it's not in a couple of years we could lose the majority we can lose the majority tomorrow uh all you gotta have is one joe manchin go i'm go i'm flipping sides yeah, or that's right or one that's person right. have a heart attack yeah. so yes. well, we could lose the house too is what i'm saying and by the way we only what do we have 10 seat majority there it's like not much yep. so we're close yep. no but, but here's the thing and this is what gets me yep. we um we we got the practical over the perfect and a lot of yes. people don't want to move until they get the perfect and I have I a problem know. with that because you're never going to get perfect. I, I understand. And, and, and again, I talk about the political culture right now. You know, since the 60s, we have seen we, we have believed that politicians should be warriors for the good. OK, and I understand that we all believe that it's like, you know, that they should be idealists. OK, but the truth is, that's not how our system was made. That's not how our system functions. And I like to look at the fact that. Who are the two presidents in the 20th century who got the most progressive um, legislation passed? It was FDR and LBJ. OK, both of these guys were basically sons of bitches who really actually did not have an ideology. You know, if people think of AD FDR as a progressive. He became more progressive. But when he came into office, he wasn't a progressive. His wife was a progressive. He was a horse trader. LBJ was a horse trader. And it's the horse traders that get things done. You know, the person who comes in, I mean, you know, look at Bernie. God bless him. I love Bernie. OK, what has Bernie done in 30 years in the Senate? You know, you don't you don't you don't get bills passed by just pounding and pounding and pounding and saying this is the way it should be. This is the way it should be. You have to be a persuader. You have to you have to be able to work with people. Yeah. What, what I like about Bernie, to be honest with you, uh, and I've had a, a number of, of friends who are congressmen, uh, my friend Bob Nay, who. Uh, he, he tells me the story all the time of how Bernie came to him with a, a great piece of legislation for Social Security. And he said, I, I want this passed. And he goes, I want you to, to move it because nobody's going to take it from me. Uh, <laughs> and they were able to Bob was able to move that through and they got it passed uh -huh. through. And Bernie didn't, uh -huh. didn't even have his name on it. Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, that's that's just one of those <laughs> there, side stories. There you go. Uh, let's there move on go. to the next one. Uh, another. Yes. I'm extremely okay. disappointed about the conditions that are continuing at the border with respect to the large number of children that are still living in horrible conditions. 
Uh, yes. Regardless of how this started, I was expected Biden to do more to f and fix this issue. Instead of fixing it, it seems uh, like they are making it worse. Uh, why are no reporters allowed, any cameras allowed? Uh, why aren't the Democrats talking about the lack of transparency now? Um, curious your thoughts. Well, I, you know, it's a very complicated thing, and I don't consider myself an expert. I'll tell you what I think about this. I think that there were unintended consequences to some of the changes Biden made, and those changes were humanitarian changes, that they weren't going to turn children away. Unaccompanied children were not going to be turned away from the border to be killed and raped and taken you know, into bondage by, by coyotes. Okay, So that was a humanitarian act. But the problem is now thousands and thousands of children are coming because they know they can get in. And so the idea that you can overnight create the kind of facilities that would be OK for these children is just a dream. You know, it can't be done that way. So I think that we're going to have to give the administration two, three, four months to deal with this in terms of enforcement, but then also creating the conditions that allow these children to survive and thrive and find families for them and all of that. But in the meantime, Biden's making a mistake, I believe, by not being more transparent about this. I um, think that, that he's got to deal with the press as it is today, which is they smell blood on anybody at any moment. And right now the blood is, why aren't you showing what's going on? And they should just show them and just keep hammering the message every day we're working on this. We're working on this. We're being as humane as we possibly can be. I'm right there with you. I think you, you'd be as transparent as they, you want to be and go, look, what do you want yeah. us to do? Uh, yeah. Congress has fallen down time and time again. We haven't I'm had sorry. a serious discussion about immigration reform since George W. Bush was in the White House. Right. Um, we haven't had any serious legislation being discussed. And right. Congress is this is a Congress problem. Right. Um, I would also say that, you know, you go back to 2010 uh, with right. the Tea Party yelling and screaming about that we spend too much money on international aid, this is a right. part of that as well. I think You're the bad. reason we used to spend money overseas is to keep people safe in their You're, communities and, and, and try and keep 100%. them home. And that's going to take years to do. Yep. That's not going to happen, you know, by April or May. You know, what he, he's talking about spending billions and billions in these countries to keep the people there. And that's what we should have been doing. You're, you're right. We should have been doing it for years. So, But, but I get a question know. like this one, because I get this a lot yeah. from people who, well, what are you going to do now, Mr. Guy? And I, he's been president 60 days. I know. I know. And also, you have to talk about intent. You just have to talk about intent. The intent of the Trump administration was to split families apart to teach them a lesson, don't come to America. That was their intent. Yep. That's a horrible, horrible, cruel, inhuman thing to do. The intent of this administration is humane. If they're failing right now, it's because they're being overwhelmed by the circumstances and you have to give them a chance to try to deal with it. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I understand the, the mentality of, hey, well, let's seal off the border, keep everybody. But you got to do something to, to help on the other side. And yeah. Trump was ma actually making it worse yes. there. And and giving them no outlet, uh, because yes, as climate right. change gets worse, we're going to see mass refugee yeah. problems in this country, yeah. which is Everywhere. why we need to be moving faster on the climate change. That's right. Oh, boy, do we. Yes. Yeah, because I look, I don't have the answer. I, I don't believe we should swing the doors open and everybody come flooding in because I don't know what we do with all those people, all the people, because you can't take all of Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. No. You can't take no. everybody. No, you can't. You can't. So what we need is Congress to, well, figure this out and, and put something into place. Yep. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, for a president who wanted to be transparent and honest with the American people, Biden is avoiding talking in public way too much. Uh, the first press conference was almost a joke, uh, Youssef says. Uh, are you concerned about his behavior? I am not at all concerned about his behavior because I think the number of people who care about the fact that he hasn't done a press conference is so minute, you know, it's not going to affect uh, public opinion. It's not going to affect, um, you, you know, his, 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 his sort of approval ratings of what he's doing, that sort of thing. That's this is sort of an inside the beltway media thing, basically, where reporters and, and media people are, you know, that's their life. So they're really upset. OK, I don't think the, the general public cares at all. Look, Jen Salky's out there every day 
communicating incredibly well. I think the intentions of this administration are being communicated very, very well. And, you know, look, sure, Biden, I think, by the way, they've scheduled one. He's going to do one. OK, but we know he doesn't do great in those situations. So, like, who cares? It's like it, it only it, 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 there's only a downside to him doing that stuff. It doesn't help in any way him as president to do a press conference. And it's, I'll be honest, if I were yeah. if I were advising him, I would tell him not to, because all yeah. you're doing is feeding the you're feeding the uh, you're feeding the wolves. Yes, because every time, by the way, you know, we need to talk about the fact of his stutter, OK, because every time he's in a situation where he talks off the cuff, he looks like he can't remember a word and you see him grimace and people think, oh, he's 78 and he's losing it. He's been doing that since he was a child. That's someone who's overcome a stutter. Yeah. He's trying to say the word. But inevitably, every time he stumbles over a word on Fox News, they're going to repeat it. Just like when he fell on the steps, it's the same thing. They're going to repeat it 100 times. And he's going to do it because that's part of his makeup. Yeah, how did we it. get here, Marshall? I mean, you go back and you, you brought up FDR a moment ago. And, yeah. you know, very few people <laughs> knew FDR uh, I know. couldn't walk. I, know. I mean, I know. you know, they... You know, yeah. the, the press didn't savage him. Uh, how did we get to this place where we're, we're savaging people instead of talking about policies and, and how we're going to make the country better off? I, you know, I, I've thought about this a lot because I have felt it myself. I felt the change happen. It's very interesting because, you know, the being making movies and television shows for for, you know, since the 80s. I've been interviewed a lot of times and was always treated incredibly well by members of the press. And the change happened sometime for me around 2007, when all of a sudden, you know, the questions were all gotcha questions to make me look bad. And it was like, wow, where did this come from? Why do you have no, why do you have no interest or belief in the good intentions of what I'm trying to do? Why, why are you trying to tear it down? So I can pin you know, it happened in the aughts. I don't know why. I think it has to do with, you know, the rise of the internet, the 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 um, financial model of news media was destroyed by that. I think you know they became very desperate to make sure that they got views and clicks and and ratings and that sort of thing. And and you know, I, I think negative sells just like negative advertising in in campaigns yep. um, sell. So. You know, it's sad for me because I think it, it contributes. And by the way, we're not just talking about Fox News. We're talking about almost all aspects of media that that they they feel that they are going to be outdone by the other people who are being negative. So they have to be negative themselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I I want news for for information. Uh, I'm, I'm not interested <laughs> in and because the news media does a wonderful job of building people up simply so yeah. they can tear them back down. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the next question. Marshall, you've spoken about p past trauma influencing current pol political attitudes uh, yes. and inflaming divisions. Uh, yeah. What is this era's trauma that will be carried forward and how will it be manifested in the future? Uh, you got your crystal ball? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think first I want to say, I, let me talk about this for a minute here because not everybody uh, knows about this. I mean, you know, trauma theory began in the mid 70s with Vietnam veterans. And, and it's really a new discipline. And, and there are a lot of things they're still discovering about trauma, but especially childhood trauma has lifelong effects on people that they did not understand. And I think what we're coming to, what's happening in our culture today is you have a whole generation of young people who understand that they were traumatized. When you talk about woke culture, when you talk about what's going on on campuses, when you talk about needing safe spaces, or they want you know, th that image banned, or you can't say this word, that's all based on the idea of trauma. And the problem is, and, and let me go a little bit deeper into that and say that, that the word trigger is a word that comes from trauma theory, that when you are triggered, it means that a past trauma is awakened in you and your whole body and system have the reaction you had from back at the time when you were actually traumatized. So it's a reawakening of something that happened in the past. OK, and um, the point of trauma treatment and therapy is to get people to be able to handle these triggers 
so that they're not triggered by them and they can stay in the present and not you know descend into that sense of helplessness and 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 fear and and despair that they felt at the time when they were traumatized when they were young okay and i think that piece of it is not understood by so many people who are in their teens and 20s and 30s today who understand that they were traumatized but they don't understand that the idea is you've got to move through that so the notion if anyone tells you that words are violent it means they don't understand trauma theory words are not violent in other words when we Back when we were kids and we said sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's it. That was the truth. OK, the goal of trauma therapy is to get people to feel that and live that in their bodies, that the present day, you know, words and taunts or whatever it is, they don't harm you. They just bring up the feeling of being harmed from when you were young and people need help to get to that point where they can feel whole in themselves in spite of what's happening. So that if they hear a word that's upsetting or someone talks about rape or someone talks about race or someone talks about any number of things that trigger people and make them feel very upset, that they don't have to have that response, that they are not as fragile as they consider themselves to be. I think this is now a huge cultural problem that we have to help people get over. Well, let me ask you this, because, you know, I, yeah. everybody I talk to is a victim. Uh, everybody I talk to is a survivor. Everybody... Yeah. Everybody yes. goes, and I'm, I'm going, yeah. you know, maybe it's just me and I'm, I'm insensitive and, and, you know, because of my white male privilege, I'm too insensitive. Uh, but I grew up in an, in a, a time where lots of bad things happen, ha bad yeah. things happen to everybody. You get yeah. up, you dust yourself off and you move yeah. forward. Now look, someone who's been raped or you know, assaulted or, you know, you know uh, veterans of a foreign war, I get their trauma, but not yeah. everybody has all this baggage. Do they? A lot of people do, yes, but the point is it's their job to get over it. In other words, I consider that I was traumatized as a child, and I was not physically abused. My parents stayed together. In other words, I'm not going to go into the specifics, but the point is I, I wasn't sexually abused or anything like that. But I think childhood trauma is a real thing that we didn't understand before. There was a kind of societal denial about uh, childhood trauma. And I think there is a great value in understanding that it's real and in and in facing up to it, but you have to do all of the work to get to the other side to say that that happened in my childhood. It shouldn't affect me today. You yeah. know, the thing is, you know, look, I, when you were talking, I was thinking about th that wonderful quote from, from Martin Luther King, when he said, it's fine to tell a man to pull himself up by his bootstraps, but it's hard for a man to do that when he has no boots. Okay. W what Martin Luther King was saying that, you know, that, African Americans truly were victimized by white America. I agree. And that we had to deal with that as a real thing that had gone on for 400 years. Okay. And that's still going on. And I think, you know, I can't, obviously I can't speak for my black friends, but I, they speak to me, you know, and what they tell me is that they need to make decisions for themselves in their own lives about how they're going to perceive themselves in the world. Are they going to perceive themselves all the time as a victim, even though they were victimized? Or are they going to perceive themselves as someone who has free will, who can move forward? It's a very complex thing because you have those feelings. People are victimized. We all are victims. We've been victimized. OK, the question is, what do you do with that then? If you define yourself as a victim, then you're just going to keep being victimized by life because you're not going to take the steps necessary to move forward with your life. So yeah, I agree with no you on that. answer to this. You know, so I, I agree with you on that. I, I've just yeah. got to this point where, look, I've had some horrible stuff happen to me over the years. I've seen people beaten, sh shot, stabbed. I've been beaten, yeah. uh, you know, all that stuff through my childhood. Uh, but wow. it's, it's one of those, and maybe I'm just fortunate. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I look at this, we, we can't all be victims. Uh, we've eventually yeah. got to put the past behind us and move forward. At least that's yeah. my view on it. Let's move on to the next qu question. Kind yes, of rolls sir. into this. Uh, yeah. Do you think the hyper woke culture making is making people too sensitive and suppressing the creativity needed to produce quality arts and entertainment? Um, what do you think yes. about that? A hundred percent. I agree with that. I, I do. And I think, by the way, there, there's a lot of debate right now about so-called cancel culture and whether it exists or not. Believe me, it exists. Yep. Um, it exists in a, in a major way. And what I'm talking about are not sort of famous authors. I'm talking about people who say something. The know, woman from Teeb and uh, Vogue. 
Uh, that woman from yeah, look, the look, black woman from Teen, Vo- Teen Vogue. Yes, yes. I mean, this is somebody that said things at 17 who had, who years ago completely um, turned against them and said I was wrong and apologized. You know, is there, there, there's got to be a chance for people to have redemption in this world. So, yes, I think there's a way in which woke culture is based on a sense of guilt. It's based on a sense that we did something wrong and we and we perpetuated something wrong and the, and that we gained from the wrongness of it in our own lives. That's what white privilege is. OK. Um, and that guilt is real and we have to deal with that guilt. But I think shaming and destroying people's lives is not the way to deal with that guilt. The way to deal with that guilt is to get rid of the injustice is to, is to you know, I, th- I like to think of it this way when when, you know, white privilege is such a it's such a polarizing term. OK, because really it just makes people feel like shit. Let's 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 be yeah. honest. You know, the, the truth is, for every instance of, quote, unquote, white privilege, you can point to an equal and opposite injustice. And the idea is get rid of the injustices. If, the, for instance, you know, if there aren't enough black people at a college, you could say all the white p- kids there were privileged. But you could also say there was an injustice that kept those black kids from being accepted by the college from having the opportunities, whatever it is, deal with the injustices. Because in my mind, what you want is for everybody to be privileged. To me, that's what America is about. You know, when my grandparents came to America and they believed that the streets were paved with gold, what they were talking about was everybody in America is privileged. All right. Well, of course that wasn't true. We know that wasn't true, but that's the idea of America. And the idea is don't take away privileges. Give them to everybody. And that's what I'd like to see happen. I'd like, to see people, I'd like people to feel that they're privileged and, and have the opportunities to, to partake of those privileges. That's, that's where we should be putting our focus. No, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, for me, it's equality, equality in the eyes of the law, that we all have the ability to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Uh, to me, that, that's yeah. where we go. Let's move on yeah. to the next one. Uh, yeah. This kind of go, flows right into that. What are your theories on the white fragility theory? I feel like we're heading in a direction that will produce even more racism than we have experienced before. I would like to hear your thoughts on what what it is and is what is and is not dangerous about this theory. Uh, great. Well, Two white guys talking about race. Uh, go. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I've not read the book, so I, I feel that I shouldn't really weigh in too deeply on this. I, I mean, I think that there's a you can talk about white fragility but you can also talk about you know the fact that 80 percent of americans despise the idea of political correctness 80 percent of americans even a majority of democrats hate political correctness okay so something is being imposed on our culture by a very small number of people that most people just can't stand they don't like the (laughs) fact that they have to watch their words and they can't make a joke and they can't say this and they can't do that or that things they said 10 years ago will come back and haunt them and ruin their lives. This is not the way to handle that situation. So calling that white fragility, I don't think is a good idea. I uh, think that's common sense. Yeah, think- my, my problem with with what with her, her, her work and I've only read some of it and I'm not an expert on it. But from what yeah. I gather from it is I can never be right. Uh, there can never be an <laughs> argument that I can me- I'm either defensive or I'm attacking or I'm dismissive. Being white is always going to be wrong. It's and, just basically apologize all the time. Right. And, and, no one and I'm not going to do way. that. Yeah. No one can live that way. So it's a hopeless it's a hopeless uh, goal. See, here's where my mindset is. And, and I, I talk about this on the show all the time. Uh, I, I was I, I'm a white kid, grew up in a black neighborhood. Uh, we used to play this neat, neat game called Chase the White Kid and Beat the Crap Out of Him. Sure, it was a fun game for somebody, wasn't for me. I learned very young. Uh, I had black friends, I had white friends, I had Latino friends. Didn't matter. White, black, brown, didn't matter. The only We were all broke. The only, mattered, the only color that mattered was green and we didn't have it, which is why I'm a union guy. Uh, this yeah. contract that, that I work to negotiate on, with, this yeah. doesn't care if you're white. It doesn't care if yeah. you're black. It doesn't care if you're yeah. Latino. It doesn't care if you're male, female, LGBTQ. It doesn't matter. 
The yeah. people doing the job under this contract get paid the same regardless. For yeah. me, that's the direction we need to be heading more into than the dividing and ripping ourselves apart because the more we divide ourselves, the less we get here. That's yeah. my theory. Uh, by the way, not only do I agree with that, I want to expand on it because I, I think that it's key to the future of the Democratic Party. There are people across this country who believe that the Democratic Party does not stand for working people anymore. And that's a tragedy. That's just ridiculous. OK, but they believe it for reasons. All right. And the, and to me, the extent to which the Democratic Party aligns itself with the culture wars is pragmatically the worst thing it can possibly do, because the vast majority of Americans believe in the economic goals of the Democratic Party. They want to see higher taxes on the rich. They want to see more opportunities for working people. They want to see freedom, economic freedom for working people, that you should be able to start your own business, have a family business, make more money. These should be the goals of the Democratic Party. The culture wars are going to play themselves out as they have played themselves out, by the way, since the 1950s, all right? They will play themselves out regardless of what the Democrats do or say. We, we are only going to lose elections if if we make the election about gender and race, we're going to lose elections. Yep. If we make the election about health care and opportunities for people. And by the way, opportunities have to be across the board. That's where race comes into it. That's where gender comes into it. But but that's something people can understand. We want opportunity for everyone. And that also means there are remedial things we have to do. There are historical injustices we have to attend to. We absolutely must attend to the fact that that the, the disparity in family wealth between black families and white families is so huge in America. And, and there are ways to attend to that in, in very specific uh, um, processes. Do you know what I mean? I mean are you, in the repar are about, you on the reparations on. bandwagon? Well, I think I think reparations is a bad word. I think there has to be remediation. In other words, you know, I think that we have to look at communities. We can't possibly figure out who you don't want to go through the process of figuring out who's a descendant of a slave. And by the way, you know, what we did to the native Americans was, was worse. And to, you know, you then are you going to start having a sliding scale? What we did to the Irish people when they came to America, what we did to the Chinese people when they came to America, I think you have to say there are historically communities who have been dealt with really unjustly by America, starting with the black community, starting with the native American community. And there are ways to deal with it at the community level to say we have to start to undo some of the things that have been done, whether it means, you know, you know, they talk about opportunity zones, which has basically been a, a joke. OK, a rip -off. but you could do a real thing. You could do, you know, there could be training and, and opportunities and loans and 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 all kinds of things that would help to create the opportunities that have been denied to whole groups of people for hundreds of years and start to create that level playing field. I believe in a level playing field. That's my point. There's a whole argument now between equity and equality, which I hate, by the way. And the idea is, you know, equality means you treat everybody the same, whether they've been screwed over or not. OK, equity means you give more to the people who've been screwed over. To me, there's a middle ground to say the goal is to treat everyone equally. If you have to start out by giving more opportunities to people who have been treated less equally, then yes, you've got to do that, but you've got to do it in a careful way. Um, and I think right now it's being done in this ham handed way by corporations and, and schools across America that I think en ends up hurting the Democrats. No, I'm right there with you. For me, it's a, it's about a chicken in every pot and a, and a Chevy in every driveway. You got to make people's <laughs> lives better. There you go. Uh, I mean, but this is the old old retail politics. You got to make people's lives better. If Joe That's Biden right. doesn't make That's people's right. lives better, uh, they're going to they're going to get slaughtered in the midterms. Uh, That's right. People That's right. start looking up and going, "This is the right, right. policy." Right. I think we'll be okay. But let me ask. But by you, the way, let me just add one thing to that. Donald Trump made hundreds of millions of people's lives worse in a thousand different ways, and still got more votes than any Republican in history. You know, at, so. We have to be mindful of the fact that it's not going to be enough just to make people's lives better. We have to have a message that resonates with Americans, that fits with how they see themselves in their lives. And I feel like Democrats have done a poor job of that, you know, until recently. And I, I'm hoping we do better. That's all. Now I'll shut up. I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, yeah. 
So let's move on to the question specifically for you. I got a couple of them. Uh, one, yep. uh, Marshall, uh, what do you think the future of tr- uh, traditional film and television production looks like, given the changes that are needed to work in the pandemic environment? Uh, what changes do you think will be permanent? Right. Okay. Well, those to me, those are two separate questions, because I think the pandemic environment is going to go away. And when it goes away, people are not going to be able to forget about it soon enough. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I think, you know, probably sometime by the end of this year, I'm hoping, God willing, we, these variants don't become much worse. I think we'll be in a situation that starts to look more or less normal. Uh, but already, pr- you know, production has resumed and seems to be moving along fine and people are not getting sick. So I think that's OK. I think there are fundamental problems in the movie business that will never be overcome that I think were created by the movie business itself. And that's a long, whole long thing. But I think it started with the way they marketed films back in the 70s. Um, I, I think the movie business is dying. And it makes me very, very sad. I think basically the model of the movie business is that they make a very small number of big blockbuster movies that cost $150, $200 million. And then everything else is basically independent and is done for a dollar and a half. And nobody can make a living that way. And, you know, and the movie theaters are unwilling to cut prices. And and so people are going to stop going to theaters, especially as they have better and better theaters in their house. And I think this is a tragedy that could have been avoided. On the other hand, television, because people have, you know, can have bigger and bigger screens in their houses, television is going to rule. And already we're seeing this blurring of the lines between movies and TV. Uh, It's going to get to the point where there is no line is what what I think. Um, And movies are going to become sort of like legitimate theater. It's like, you know, yes, some people will love to go out to the movies because they want to get away from the house and go out, but it's not going to be a national habit. And that's a, that's a tragedy, I think for, for, for our culture. Yeah. I know a lot of people who are looking forward to going back to the movies and, and all of that, but I'm like, you know, I can go, I can go on, on online and I can get those pay six, seven bucks and I can have a front, a first run movie right there on my, you know, 60 inch TV and and sit on my own couch and use my own bathroom and, and all of that stuff. Uh, So, so yeah, I, I I see that. And and look with, with Amazon and with Netflix and with some of these other ones, they're doing movies specifically uh, for, you know, you know, their platform. I look at Eddie Murphy just did coming to America two, directly, you know, I guess for prime. That's right. This is what's happening. And some of them will have a two week, run in a few theaters and say it's a movie, but basically it was made to be seen on a television, Yeah, you know? So next one, uh, is the, is there a redo of 30 something in the works? Uh, has pandemic put an end to many of the projects that were under work in the TV industry? There was a redo or a re I, I shouldn't say a redo. It was actually a reimagining of 30 something because what it was was about the children of the original characters. The original characters were in it, but since the children are now in their 30s, it was about what it's like to be in your 30s today. And it's something we, we very much love, and, and it, was, it was done in by the pandemic. And we hope and pray that at some point we'll be able to get it going, but right now it's, it's not happening, and we're sad about it. Yeah, I, I'd be interested to see that. A lot of things I think are kind of on hold. And, you know, you know going back to history, you think about, you know, the uh, the last big one of these, you know, in 1918. Yeah. Um, as yeah. soon as everything opened up, we had the Roaring Twenties. Yes. So right. I'm, I'm expecting right. a, I'm expecting a boom. And I think Wall Street is, too. I think it was uh, was it yes. Goldman Sachs who said expecting eight percent growth this year, which is yeah. almost unimaginable. Yeah, well, it's because they're coming back from such a right. from a deep hole. But I, I think people can't. You know, a lot of people are saying, "Well, you know, we're never going to forget this, and it's going to change our lives forever." Forever. I think the opposite is going to be. And by the way, that that pandemic in eighteen, nineteen, and twenty is almost never talked about. In other words, the and, and killed the same number of Americans, and you know, people just put it behind them because they were so sick of it. It was such a horrible thing. And it was so private, they just went on with their lives. So let me go back to this now, because in the earlier question about trauma, yeah. um, you know, how many of us are going to be victims of, of this? I mean, you know, I think of the kids, I think of, you know, I think of my kids, you know, they're yes. going to, they, I yeah. think they've lost a whole year of education. I have confidence yeah. they'll pick it back up, but you yeah. know, how many people are going to have, you know, the kind of trauma that you were talking about? 
I think a lot of people, I think you're going to see a lot of health issues. You know, they're already talking about people suddenly presenting with stage four cancer because they weren't getting screened during the year. You know, they didn't go to the doctor or that sort of thing. There are going to be all kinds of yeah. ancillary damages from this that are going to take years to get over. And by the way, we're not talking about long COVID. We're not talking about the millions of people who may suffer for years from this disease, which, you know, I've been reading articles about it. It could be a public health issue literally for the next 10 years or even more because it's so hard for many, many people to get over this thing. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. Last question I've got for you because we got through them all. And good on you. I'm really thrilled about that. I got through all 11 questions. Uh, the last one is if you were writing the 1980s Rocky type script for America 20, 2021, uh, yes. With the huge comeback after four years of Trump, the riot yes. crisis, an incredibly divided country, would Biden and his policies be the guy you would have cast as the hero? <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I think it wouldn't have been Biden, but it would have been his policies. In, in other words, but that may be because I've been deeply immersed in Democratic politics for the last four years, and I've come to understand that we are not going to get anything done unless we have people in the middle, all the independents, you know, that that and it's not that I'm not a progressive. That's not the issue. It doesn't matter what I believe. It matters what we can get done. I'm a pragmatic progressive. Yep. And and the point is that we need the policies that will make the huge changes in America, but still allow America to look at itself and say, this is Americans, excuse me, to look at the country and say, this is the country I know. This is the country I recognize. We're not going to turn it over into something else. And I think Biden is reassuring in that way. And his policies are reassuring. Look, we have to remake this country in terms of infrastructure. We have to remake this country in terms of energy. We have to remake this country in terms of corporate governance so that workers get paid. Just the, and healthcare. The four things alone are such immense changes that have to take place in the next 10 years. We have to do it in such a way that, that People feel that it's the country they want to live in. And that means getting the middle to say, yes, that's what I want. No, no. And we have to have the people giving the pressure and, and we need to be pushing in the direction for the things that we want, just like they did yep. during the FDR years. Uh, yep. All good stuff. Marshall, I appreciate the time. This was fantastic. Uh, and you. I'm sorry I kept you over. I said 45 minutes. We're at 47. No, I'm happy, man. <laughs> so the next time I'm going to shoot for the Goodbye. 45. Uh, no, but no longer <laughs> but I, I appreciate the time and uh, i i hope we got there we got to everybody's questions i hope that answered it for everybody uh and if you've got more in the future we'd love to have you because i'd love to have you back marshall and i'm happy to answer any questions on think spot as well good so, stuff i appreciate you. your time my friend thanks so much thanks man okay uh there our good friend marshall herskovitz and and look you know if you've got other questions Want to hear them? You can email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Drop them here on ThinkSpot. I hope that answered your questions. Uh, we will be back in two weeks for our next Q&A session, so I look forward to seeing you get again there. Uh, thanks so much. We'll see you back here next time.